So I have some basic rules uh, for EKGs. Um, of course, in medical school, everyone learns about rate, rhythm, and access. Well, here's the, uh, the best way to do this, and then we'll go through all the other segments. Um, basically, we're going to go through a uh, quick EKG review and then go through a whole bunch of EKGs together. The answers are on the back. The last slide of the lecture is the answers. So, um, first of all, uh, the rate, the best way to do this is to count up all the QRX complexes at the bottom or along the rhythm, rhythm strip and multiply by six. It's the most accurate method, especially if somebody's in an irregular rhythm. Um, you could do that 300, 150, 100 uh, technique. It's not all that accurate. If somebody's in an irregular rhythm, you're not going to know what it is. Um, rhythm is the next step. you got to look for the P's. Is there a P before every QRS? And is there a QRS after every P? Um, if so, then we, that, we call that a sinus rhythm. Um, otherwise, it could be something else, and we'll go through that. Access is also very important. Um, you look at lead 1 and 2. They're right on top of each other to the very left side of the EKG, 1 and 2. If they're both upright, two thumbs up, you got normal access. Um, if 1 is up and 2 is down, 2 is leaving. Uh, they're leaving each other. That's left access. If 1 is down and 2, in the, two is up, that's right access. That's right access uh, deviation. Um, you can also double check lead AVF for right access deviation. It's much more accurate for right access deviation. However, 1 and 2 uh, are by far the most important for left access deviation. And the most common deviation is left access. So just use 1 and 2. If you have 1 up, two down and three down, uh, then you have left anterior fascicular block. It's a quick shortcut to figure that out. Um, next, you want to look at the PR interval. Um, you want it to be under 200 milliseconds, which is five small boxes or one large one. You want to look at QRS duration. should be under 120, which is three small boxes. Um, if you noticed uh, a pattern here, um, each small box is 40 milliseconds. Um, QT interval should be under 400. Usually for men it's under uh, 440. For women it's under 460. Um, but we really don't get too concerned about it unless it starts getting over 500 or, or into the 600s. Um, 400 is 10 small boxes. Um, next you look at the ST segments. Are they elevated? Are they uh, depressed? Um, what can we uh, tell from that? And we'll go through a bunch of EKGs. Um, next you want to look for Q waves. Um, the most important thing about Q waves is that the duration is greater than 0.04 millimeters. The duration is greater than a small box. So if your Q wave is greater than or equal to one small box in width, that's when it's an abnormal uh, Q wave. It has nothing to do with the amplitude. A lot of attendings and people you see will tell you, well, it has to be one-third the height of the next QRS or whatever it is. That's absolutely not true. The only thing that makes it abnormal is the width of it. If it's greater than 40 uh, milliseconds or one single small box then that is what makes it abnormal. Um, next you look at everything else and uh, always follow the criteria. Um, I always tell people follow that criteria that's uh, the most accurate way of uh, determining what is really going on on an EKG. So here's your basic um, EKG in magenta um, with the various segments labeled. You start with the P, you have the PR segment next, then a Q if there is one, then your R, then your S, then your ST segment, your T wave, and then possible U waves, and then the next P starts. Um, you also have the PR interval, the QRS interval, QT, ST segment, um, all that stuff. This is basic uh, cardiology, but it's here for reference. So here's access, and the reason I want to point this out is if you take a look um, at uh, lead one and two, two is down there in the bottom. Um, if you look, um, if, if one is a positive deflection, which means one is upright and two is upright, um, that puts you in the normal uh, box down there. If it's going down towards two and over to the right towards one, you have uh, two upright deflections, two thumbs up, you're good. If it's upright in one, which means it's positive and going towards one, and negative in two means it's leaving. Uh, they're both leaving each other. Negative in two means they're going away from two, which is that perpendicular negative 30 degree line. Left axis deviation is negative 30 to negative 90. That's why it's much more accurate. If you use AVF and it's going away from AVF, like it's going down away from AVF, you're catching that, that 30 degrees um, of error there. You might be calling a lot of people left axis deviation that really aren't. So. Uh, be careful with that. That's why I have this on here. Uh, next is just uh, to quickly um, 
look at T waves, if you look at this first one here uh, called hyperkalemia, hyperkalemic T waves, especially in the very beginning uh, of hyperkalemia, are tall, narrow, and pointed. Um, hyperacute uh, ischemia gives you wide and broad um, T waves that, that are not pointed. Um, and they're very symmetric. Keep that in mind. They're symmetrical. Ischemic uh, hyperacute T waves are symmetrical. Then you look at the normal variant, um, which slopes up slowly, then comes down uh, rather quickly. Um, next, we'll take a look at AV blocks. Um, first degree AV block all the way over here. Your PR interval is greater than 200. That's very simple. It's one large box. Second degree AV block is a little tricky. There's, it's called second degree AV block. You see group beating. If you look at that little uh, picture there, I got three beats together, then a gap, then three beats together. That's kind of what it looks like on an EKG. You see groups of beats uh, together. There's two kinds. There's Mobitz type 1 or type 1 AV, uh, second degree AV block, where the PR interval prolongs, then it drops. Um, type 2, the PR interval is constant, then it drops, um, and that's your basic uh, breakdown. Um, third degree is um, the, the, probably the hardest one to figure out out of all of these. Um, the PR uh, interval is very variable. Um, they'll never match up. Sure, sometimes coincidentally you may have one PR interval look like the other, but they're very variable. Always look for third degree block in people that are bradycardic. It's very, very tricky. If somebody's bradycardic, Keep your eyes peeled, see if they have third degree AV block. I drew a line right down the middle, that dotted line. On the left side, these people don't typically need a pacer. On the right side, um, these people typically need a pacer. The reason is um, type 1 uh, uh, AV block, first degree AV block, and second degree AV block type 1 uh, both usually happen at the AV node or higher, um, whereas uh, type 2 and 3 are all um, below the node, or they call them in infrahissian. Um, type 2, second degree AV block, usually decompensates and becomes 3 uh, rather quickly. Now, if, you're, if your first degree AV block is symptomatic, then they automatically qualify for a pacemaker. So it does say no pacer, but if either of those two are symptomatic, then they do get a pacemaker. Next, we'll talk about the arrhythmias. Um, they're either narrow or wide. We'll talk about the wide ones first because that's the easiest. In a wide uh, rhythm tachycardia, you can only have really a, a couple of options. It's either VTAC or VFib, which um, we'll look at EKGs and you'll see what it looks like. Or you can have something called SVT with aberrancy. Um, the word aberrancy just means aberrant conduction or there's slow conduction through the uh, one of the bundle branches. Either you have a left bundle branch block or a right bundle branch block. SVT just means it's one of the rhythms over here on the side. It's a narrow um it's one of the top uh, narrow rhythms coming from the supraventricular area, um, but the left bundle branch block or right bundle branch block is what makes it look wide and make it look like VTAC. Um, so that's what the wide ones look like. The narrow ones, we call them SVTs, supraventricular tachycardia. All that means is it's not originating in the ventricles. If it was, it'd be ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. Um, anything above that um, is called an SVT. Now, they don't have to be tachycardic. They don't have to be... Uh, tachycardic, almost all of these have an equivalent uh, that isn't tachycardic. So instead of sinus tach, it would be sinus rhythm. Instead of atrial tach, it would be an atrial ectopic rhythm. Instead of junctional tach, it would be a junctional rhythm, and etc. So sinus rhythm or sinus tach is the normal uh, response to exercise, hypovolemia, fever. If a patient is in sinus tach, it's an appropriate response to some uh, some uh, some disturbance going on in their body. They have a fever, they're hypovolemic, hypotensive, um, maybe they took a medication, maybe they just exercised. If I stand up right now and start running in place, I will be going to sinus tach. Um, it's usually a slow, you slowly go into sinus tach and slowly come out of it. Um, if you don't, then it's probably some other rhythm. It's a sudden onset or sudden offset, it's probably something else. So sinus tachycardia is uh, pretty normal and I wouldn't uh, get too uh, excited about it. atrial tachycardia or an atrial ectopic rhythm. It's a different P wave. The atrial um, contraction is occurring, but it's coming from somewhere else. There's another spot in the atria somewhere that's triggering this automatic uh, rhythm, and uh, you know you got to look for it. Um, usually, the P waves will be upside down. If it's coming low from the right atrium, the P waves will be retrograde activating the atria and it'll look upside down. Junctional tachycardia is just a rhythm coming from the junction which does include the AV node. It could be a junctional rhythm. We call it a junctional rhythm if it's slow. Usually junctional rhythms are in the range of about 40 
uh, to 60. Anything over 60, we call it uh, junctional rhythm. Um, anything uh, higher than that, we call it junctional tachycardia. The way you know it's a junctional rhythm is there's no P waves. Um, if, it's, if it's slow, we call it junctional bradycardia, obviously. Um, but there's no P waves at all. There's only a few rhythms that give you no P waves, so keep that in mind. Um, the next two, four and five, are both irregularly irregular. That's why I put that there. You have uh, MAT, which is multi multifocal atrial tachycardia. Um, this just means that there's multiple um, areas in the atria that are firing um, and causing three or more different looking P waves. You have to have at least three or more different looking P waves. Um, because if you have two different P waves only, then that's the sinus P wave and an ectopic atrial uh, extra P wave. So that puts you as an, at an ectopic atrial rhythm. So it has to be at least three or more. Usually this is due to lung disease or some kind of lung pathology. If you fix the lungs, you'll fix the rhythm. Uh, the next one is atrial fibrillation. I have a whole lecture on this. Click through the through the YouTube videos and you'll find it. Atrial fibrillation is an irregularly irregular rhythm with no P wave. So this is the second one with no P waves. Um, basically, the atria just fibrillate or kind of quiver. Um, they're firing randomly from all over the place, tiny little firings, and those tiny little firings um, ultimately uh, trigger the AV node at various uh, times, um, and that's why you end up with a narrow rhythm. As long as it triggers through the AV node, you end up with a narrow tachycardia. You end up uh, traveling down the bundle of Hiss, and both atria, both ventricles contract at the same exact time. That's what makes it narrow. All, all the surface EKG picks up is a right and a left ventricle. Both contract together. That gives you that powerful uh, QRS that's narrow. Um, if there's any kind of bundle branch block or delay, um, one ventricle will fire before the other, and that's why you get that wide um, electrical signal on the uh, surface EKG. Um, atrial flutter is real simple. It's, it's this big macro reentrant tachycardia. Basically, if you look at the tricuspid valve, it's this loop uh, going around the tricuspid valve. Um, that gives you that very uh, traditional sawtooth pattern on the um, the EKG, and, and you'll pick that up right away when you see it. Um, AV nodal reentrant tachycardia. Um, this is the tachycardia when everybody says, oh, he's an SVT, he's an SVT. Um, that's what they mean. They, he, they mean he's an AV nodal reentrant tachycardia. This is a tachycardia within the AV node. Um, it's usually pretty fast. Um, this also has no P wave. If there is a P wave, sometimes it's buried in the QRX, QRSs and you can't really find it, or sometimes it shows up after the QRS. Um, but basically, there's no P wave. Um, so now you have th three without a P wave. Junctional tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, and AVNRT. AFib is easy to figure out. It's irregular, irregular. But what about junctional tachycardia? If you have somebody tacking away at 110, 120, how do you know he's not an AVNRT? Well, the way you know is the rhythm gives it away. Um, and, or the rate, I'm sorry. The rate gives it away. Junctional tachycardia, they can be a little bit tachycardic. They can get up to like 110, 120 at the most. Uh, but they'll not get any faster than that. AVNRT, these people are really tachycardic. They're like 220, 240, 260, sometimes 280, 180. Um, these people are pretty, pretty tachycardic, and that's usually how you know. Um, AVRT, the last one, AV uh, reentrant tachycardia. Um, these are accessory pathways within the uh, uh, ventricles or atria. The most common example uh, of these is WPW syndrome or wolf parkinson white syndrome. There's an accessory pathway either on the left or right um, between the ventricles and atria, and it's causing um, conduction uh, to go through there. So this is your basic heart, um, and this is your SA node up there, firing down to your AV node, going down the bundle of Hiss, then going down to the right side, which is a single branch, and then to the left side where there's two branches. There's the left anterior fascicle. The word fascicle just means branch or the uh, left posterior fascicle, which also um, means branch. Uh, but this is basically how it happens. If you draw a line here across the uh, AV um, line, which I did, I draw that line straight across and I made it longer and wider than the heart. Um, anything above that is supraventricular. Anything below that obviously is ventricular. And um, we'll go through EKGs and you'll see. So anything that actually hits the AV node will give you a narrow um, tachycardia, unless there's block below that, like a left bundle or a right bundle. Um, but any of those rhythms that come from on top and hit the AV node, as long as your AV node and, and infrahissian system conducts properly, you'll get narrow rhythms.
So let's talk about ST elevations. Um, a, a lot of people say, well, he has ST elevations. Well, it depends on where they are. Up to one millimeter of ST elevation is okay in the limb leads, and up to three millimeters is okay in the chest leads. Your chest leads are your V1 through V6. Your limb leads are your 1, 2, 3, AVF, uh, AVL, AVR. Um, so that's okay. People can have these chronically. As long as they never change, we're fine. But any new elevations, no matter what, is not okay. Um, on the limb lead side, the shape really doesn't matter. An elevation is an elevation. You see that there um, after that... Uh, spike before the dome starts that ST segment is elevated the dome is your T segment I drew it as best I could on the other side the shape does matter if it's that shape right there it's horrible um, it's bad if you put two dots on top of that dome there it's a sad upside down smiley face that's one way uh, to remember this but the shape matters any other shape is not a big deal and we'll have plenty of EKGs uh, to go through this so what's the order of events in an ST elevation MI? Anybody guess? What happens first? Do the ST segments go up first? Do you get Q waves? Do you get T wave inversions? Um, it kind of matters, but here's the basic order. Um, the first thing you get is these hyperacute T waves. I showed you them in the beginning. You get these wide, broad T waves. Now, the reason we usually don't catch this on an EKG is because the patient was still at home and his wife was trying to convince him to get into the hospital. They only last about 10, 15 minutes and then they go away. Then you get the ST segment elevation. So the ST segments elevate, and there's a nice example there in block two of what an ST segment looks like when it's elevated. Um, and then you get T wave inversions if you look at square three and four. And then you ultimately get a Q wave, um, and then eventually in, in, in six, um, you end up with uh, your T waves go back to normal. Um, ST elevation MIs are more likely to, you, to leave a Q wave, and it really depends on infarct size, but ST elevation MIs, if they're big, will leave a Q wave. 75% of ST elevation MIs usually leave a Q wave. Um, non STEMIs usually never do. So STEMIs evolve. I want to uh, stress this, and I spelled it kind of wrong, but evolve or evolve. Um, but STEMIs always evolve. Keep getting EKGs if you're not sure. A guy comes in, he says, I have chest pain. You look at his EKG. How do you know if it's new or old? What if you had those ST elevations all along? Um, keep getting EKGs every five minutes. Plaster the walls with EKG paper. It's free. It's graph paper. Just do it. If they all look the same, the patient is not having an ST elevation MI. Keep that in mind. If they all look the same, it's not a STEMI. So here's your basic EKG. I tried to draw this as simply as I could. You got your limb leads over here, one, two, three, R, L, and F. And then you got your uh, chest leads or your anterior precordial leads, V1 through V6. I uh, color-coded them because this is uh, when they say contiguous EKG leads or someone having an ST elevation of mine, contiguous leads, these are your contiguous leads. 2, 3, and AVF are your uh, uh, are contiguous. Um, 1, L, and 6 are contiguous. 1 and 2 are. 2, 3, 4, and 5 are. And you'll see why. Here I put the names of all the different uh, walls that are affected. Your septal posterior walls, your anterior wall. The anterior wall is the blue. Um, your inferior wall is 2, 3, and AVF, and your lateral are 1, L, and 6. This is a nice little diagram. Um, then I tried to over uh, put, put on the actual uh, blood vessels that are affected. Your inferior wall uh, is your RCA, your lateral wall is usually your CERC, and your LAD is the septal um, and anterior, uh, as well as, um, you know, it even can affect the posterior. The RCA feeds the posterior as well. Um, and, and, and then there's collaterals to the, uh, from the LAD to there as well. Um, so reciprocal changes are very, very important. The inferior leads um, reciprocate to AVL and 1, mainly AVL. Your anterior leads reciprocate to your inferior leads, and your lateral leads also reciprocate to your inferior leads. So if you have ST elevations in your anterior or lateral leads, you should always have depressions in your inferior leads. If you have inferior elevations, you should see AVL and 1 being depressed. Now, if you note, nothing actually reciprocates to the anterior leads this is very very important nothing reciprocates to your anterior leads if you ever see st depressions in your anterior leads that's a posterior mi nothing reciprocates there you cannot have um, ischemia in your anterior leads um, ischemia does not localize i want to uh, stress this 
um, time and time again. If you see ST depressions in just one lead or two leads, it's not inferior ischemia. If you see 2, 3, and AVF depressed, or your anterior leads depressed, or your lateral leads depressed, if it's only those leads, it is not ischemia. It's something else. For example, if you see AVL and one depressed, you should be looking for an inferior ST elevation MI. It's probably the reciprocal change to an inferior MI. Um, if it's a uh, inferior depressions, if, if uh, your inferior leads, T3 and AVF, are depressed, you should be looking for an anterior or lateral MI. There's nothing else that causes that. Um, so keep that in mind. Even cardiologists screw this up. ST elevations and, and I'm sorry, ischemia does not localize on an EKG. If somebody has ischemia, true ischemia, all their leads will have ST depressions, and most sensitive are V5, um, V4, V6, but mainly V5 on that side, and lead 2 on the other side. So if somebody has real ischemia, they're going to have all their leads depressed. Keep that in mind when we go through these EKGs. So 80% um, of the time, most people have a right coronary artery infarct. Um, the other 20% is a left coronary artery infarct. And you can tell the difference from far away. From outside the room, you can tell. RCAs are usually hypotensive, bradycardic, slow arrhythmias. Everything's like slow, 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 low, low, low. Your left uh, uh, infarcts are usually hypertensive a little, slightly tachycardic. They're in a lot of pain and anxiety and very, very uncomfortable. Everything's kind of ramped up and fast, fast, fast. Um, here's your coronary anatomy. Your RCA um, gives off first branch to the SA node, then the RV branch, which is why you get an RV infarct with very proximal RCA um, disease. Then you have the posterior lateral, posterior descending, which is why RV infarcts or inferior infarcts um, give you um, posterior MIs. And then the PLA um, and PDA, um, the AV node comes off uh, distal branch there. Um, your left uh, coronary artery breaks down into two main arteries, the LAD and the CERC. CERC gives off these lateral OMs and travels through the AV groove uh, of your heart. And then the left anterior descending uh, feeds the anterior wall through the diags, um, as well as the septal wall through the septal uh, perforators. They're called septals there on the diagram. And I drew these superimposed over the various uh, parts of the heart. You see the RCA kind of feeds that inferior wall um, and eventually the posterior wall. Um, and your uh, left feeds the LAD and the lateral stuff with the CERC. Um, you'll notice um, that because of RCA infarcts feeds the SA node and AV node, those are the ones that get those bradycardias and bradyrhythmias. So one very important uh, type of infarct that must be discussed to separate the children from the adults in terms of medicine, um, especially if you're an ER doctor, you need to recognize this right away, especially if you're a cardiologist or a medicine uh, physician as well. But RV infarcts are very, very important. Um, it's If you have an RCA infarct high enough, you affect the RV branch and it knocks out your RV. Um, so what is the point of an RV or, or even an LV? What is the point of your ventricles? When they contract, they push blood forward either into your pulmonary artery or your aorta. But when they relax, they suck blood back to themselves. That's very, very important. Um, so it's important for them to relax. If you have an RV infarct and your RV is not relaxing, it's not sucking blood back to itself. That's why you get those symptoms of JVD, uh, leg edema, um, and hypotension. The reason you get the hypotension is there's no more preload. The heart is not filling. Uh, the left ventricle is not filling, so it cannot generate a pressure. It's pumping, you know, almost no blood. Your lungs are clear, so when it when the LV contracts and relaxes, it sucks blood out of the lungs and pushes it forward. But if your RV isn't able to push that blood forward into the lungs, you're going to have no preload, and your heart doesn't pump very efficiently or very well at all. That's why you get hypotensive. So on an exam, they're going to ask you, patient comes in with an acute MI, has inferior ST elevations, blah, blah, blah. Here's his physical exam. They're going to give you hypotensive hypotensive, slightly tachycardic, uh, maybe even with bradycardias if, if the AV um, branches out. Um, and they're going to be hypotensive. Uh, they're going to have JVP or JVD. They're going to have leg edema, and their lungs will be clear. This is important. The lungs will be clear. Those are your signs and symptoms. So how do you treat this? you got to fill up their preload. 
they're preload dependent. You've got to tank them up. You give them lots and lots of fluids. Um, lots of studies have been done on this. 95% of people need about 18 liters of fluids. Of course, you're never going to do this in the ER. Um, one way to know that you've filled them up enough is that you start hearing it in their lungs. You either hear rails and crackles in their lungs, means you filled them up enough, or their FiO2 uh, requirement goes up. They were on zero liters of nasal cannula or one or two liters. Now you've had to crank them up to three or four or more than that. Once you can hear it in their lungs, you've filled them up enough. Uh, but we never usually get to that. They're usually in the cath lab and they're um, having their RCA uh, opened up. Um, the treatment for this is also to wipe off uh, the nitroglycerin. Sometimes they've gotten nitro in the ambulance and you can't really do anything about it, but if somebody put nitro paste on them, you take the nitro paste off. Things you don't ever want to give are beta blockers, nitro, and morphine. That just worsens the hypotensin, the hypotension and or the bradycardia. Nitro shouldn't be given in any MI uh, ever. Um, you can read some of my other articles or videos uh, to find out why. Um, it's beyond the scope of this, but you shouldn't give them any of these things. It's going to worsen their hemodynamics. Um, how do you diagnose an RV infarct? If you look at this diagram I drew here, um, lead two uh, mainly is the LV inferior wall, and lead three is mainly the RV. So if you look at ST elevations, if the ST elevation in lead three is higher than lead two, then you have an RV infarct. If the ST elevation uh, in lead too high is is higher than it's mainly an a, um, inferior wall uh, infarct. So this is very very sensitive and specific. It's actually more sensitive and specific in in some studies um, than a, than a uh, right sided EKG. So you don't really need to do a right sided EKG. All the information that's that you need is contained uh, right here. If you want to do a quick cheap right sided EKG, just take V4. Um, from under the left nipple and just put it under the right nipple and just print another EKG. If it's elevated, um, then you have an RV infarct. But like I said, you really don't need to do that. All the information is contained within the normal EKG. If the ST elevation in 3 is higher, the injury pattern is going mainly towards um, the RV. So uh, some quick questions. What do ST depressions in lead V1 through V3 represent? Anyone know? Is it reciprocal changes, posterior MI, ischemia, or congenital abnormality? Um, obviously, if you've been listening to this, the answer is posterior MI. It's nothing else. Nothing reciprocates there. It's not ischemia. Ischemia does not localize. Ischemia is not just going to happen in leads V1 through V3. If the person's really ischemic, it'll be V5 and 2, and they'll be everywhere. So nothing reciprocates there, and it is absolutely a posterior MI. You do not need to do a posterior EKG or take the EKG paper and flip it upside down and hold it up to a light. That just looks silly. Um, imagine what your patients in the emergency room or elsewhere are going to be thinking if you're taking the paper and look at it upside down through a light. So you don't need to do that. Any ST depressions in V1 through V3 are posterior MI. So here's a first EKG. Um, you want to look at the rate, rhythm, and access. You can quickly add up these uh, lead, uh, at the bottom. The patient is definitely not tachycardic. There are P waves before every QRS, so he's sinus rhythm. If you look at lead 1 and 2, they're both upright and puts us in a normal axis. But if you look at lead 1 and AVF, they're leaving each other. So that puts you in a left axis. This is that extra 30 degrees that doesn't get caught when you use 1 and AVF. That's why I highly recommend that everybody uses 1 and 2. For right axis deviation, you should definitely use AVF if somebody uh, appears to have right axis deviation. Um, but this is just an example of that. All the ST segments look good. Uh, QRS looks fine. The QT interval does not look prolonged. And this is your basic normal EKG, but mainly to point out that you're going to miss those 30 degrees if you're looking at left axis deviation using AVF. Uh, next rhythm here, um, what do we got? We got your uh, basic normal EKG. Every QRS does have a P in front of it. Some of the uh, QRSs, uh, especially around if you look at V1 or V2, looks like there's an early uh, beat. There's an early P, and that gives you a PAC or a uh, premature atrial contraction, which is what that is. Um, and then if you look at that last lead, the second lead in V4, you have a normal uh, PQRS, and then you have a very wide abnormal beat. That's called a PVC, or a premature ventricular contraction. Those are always wide. Um, so that's basically just to point out the difference between a PAC and a uh, PVC. If you look at the rhythm strip at the bottom, it also matches pretty well. The PAC is very narrow, and the PVC is quite wide. Uh, the next rhythm here, 
if you look at it, um, if you look at V4, you see an ST elevation there um, with that little notch or uh, what's called, uh, in some cases, an epsilon wave. If you look at lead two, you also see that notch. Um, that notch is actually, uh, this is called benign early repolarization. You have uh, chronic ST elevations. It's usually a young male, most sometimes African American, but these um, ST elevations are not the correct shape uh, to be in acute MI. If you look at V1, V2, V3, it's concave upwards. It forms a cave facing upright. That is not an ST elevation MI. On the limb lead side, obviously the ST segment shape doesn't really matter. It's a little bit elevated, but you got that little notch that gives it away that it's early repull, plus that notch and the ST segments are kind of elevated everywhere. This is not to be confused with pericarditis. That one looks a little different. We'll have those later. Next EKG here shows these deep inverted T waves. These are the inverted T waves. It could be uh, an acute MI uh, or acute ischemia. Um, T wave inversions do localize. So if you have anterior T wave inversions, you actually could have a PE. Anterior T wave inversions that are deep and, and wide like this could be a PE, could be COPD, um, could also be a brain injury. Some people have a brain hemorrhage or CNS uh, involvement. They get these deep inverted T waves. Now, these are the real deep inverted T waves. Sometimes you get people call me and say, hey, there's a, there's a, there's a T segment or an inverted T wave. Like if you look at AVF, that, that little T that's inverted there, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about these big, deep uh, T waves. These are the ones you worry about, not the one like the one in AVF. Next EKG. What do you see here? You see some ST elevations in uh, V4, V5, V6. Um, you see quite a prolonged PR interval. If you look at uh, lead three, uh, the second P wave there um, is longer uh, than a large box. It puts you at a prolonged PR interval. Lead two does show some uh, ST elevation. There's no reciprocal changes. It's probably another case of benign early repull. Uh, patient seems somewhat bradycardic. I didn't count them up. Um, you can do that, but this is basically another uh, early repo with a uh, what appears to be a, a prolonged uh, first degree AV block or prolonged PR interval. The next EKG here um, mainly shows another prolonged PR interval. If you look at it, this one's even more prolonged. So on this uh, EKG, you see the there's a prolonged PR interval. You got the one, two, three beats then a fourth beat, and then you got like a P wave and no beat. This is called a non-conducted um, APC. What happened is the P wave fired way too early. Uh, if you compare that P wave to the previous P waves, the P to P interval is way shorter than the other ones, and it's a non-conducted uh, APC. You got a big gap there. It almost looks like group beating, but it's not because it's only that one missing beat. The next one here, um, if you look at it uh, just globally from far away, you see this sawtooth kind of pattern. You look at lead two and three, and you can also see it in the rhythm strip down at the bottom. You see it in V4. This is your basic uh, atrial flutter pattern, um, and there's nothing really uh, more exciting going on. These can be easily be ablated now. Um, here's the next rhythm. Um, this basically shows a low voltage in the limb leads. The criteria is less than 5 millimeters um, of amplitude up and down. So AVL, if you look at AVL, there's an up and down, and none of it would equal one uh, large box. If you look at the, the precordial leads, the criteria says uh, 10 millimeters of amplitude. So this is a low voltage EKG. If a patient comes in like this and previously had a pretty normal looking EKG with normal voltage, what do you want to worry about? Something that's causing the heart to not conduct uh, very well. There's only two things really that do that. Either fluid around the heart or air around the heart. Could have a pneumothorax, could have worsening COPD, could have a pericardial uh, effusion. So watch out about those. Contrary to public opinion, obesity does not cause this. Now somebody is really obese possibly, but obesity in general does not cause low voltage. Um, there are other things that do and just be wary of that. Uh, the next EKG here, if you follow this uh, pretty closely, you look, you see P wave, QRS, P wave, P wave, QRS, P wave, QRS. It's kind of confusing, um, hard to tell. If you look at all the PR intervals, um, they don't all match. Um, no two PRs on the rhythm strips um, 
seem to match each other. This person is in a uh, complete heart block. Um, you've got the P waves that kind of march out uh, okay, and you've got this ventricular escape rhythm um, coming from the junction or junctional escape rhythm uh, because it's narrow, this junctional escape rhythm at about 40 beats uh, or maybe even less than that uh, per minute. Next EKG here, you've got a fast rhythm that looks a little wide. If you uh, look at V2, um, you see two, two beats close to one another, then a little gap, then another gap. You see that it's irregular. You don't really see P waves. With no P waves, you're left with AFib, junctional rhythm, or AVNRT. It definitely doesn't look fast enough to be AVNRT. Um, junctional is a possibility, but it's really irregular. Junctionals are very uh, regular. Probably a fib. Actually, definitely is a fib. And the reason it's wide is because you have a left bundle branch block. If you look at lead two, when it's pointing down like that, it's a left bundle branch block. If you if you uh, look at um, lead V1, uh, also downwards, it's a left bundle branch block. If lead two and one were positive and upright, with that bunny ear pattern, that makes it a right bundle branch block. Um, if you notice, the patient has, if you look at V5, V6, V4, lead 2, uh, if you look all around, the patient has ST depressions. So this patient is tachycardic with ST depressions. So he has cardiac significant coronary artery disease. He's ischemic when he's a little tachycardic. Um, so it probably needs a uh, cath or a stress test at some point as well. The other way to be able to tell that it's not VTAC, if you look at lead 5, um, there's a clear R pointing upwards and a clear S going downwards. Anytime you see a RS in the precordial leads, V1 through V6, it's not VTAC. So that's a quick shortcut to differentiate a wide rhythm from a SVT with aberrancy, in this case a fib with left bundle, versus VTAC because there's a RS that's not VTAC. The next rhythm here... If you look at it closely, you see group beating, actually. You see like three beats together, then two, then two, then two, then two. Um, if you look at the PR interval to see if it's getting longer and longer, and it actually is. If you look at the bottom strip there, V5, pretty close together, a little wider, even wider, then boom, you lose a beat, and then the same pattern kind of continues. This makes it Mobitz type 1, second degree AV block. If they're not symptomatic, you just leave them alone. No pacemaker. If they ultimately ever get symptomatic, they would ultimately need a pacemaker. Um, here's another rhythm. You got PQRS, PPQRS, PQRS, PPQRS. So you also got group beating. Um, you got uh, basically two beats together, two beats together. Is the PR interval getting longer or not? In this case, it looks like it is. Um, you've got uh, the PR interval getting longer. And then there's a P with a non-conducted beat. So you're dropping beats after that. Um, so they're dropped uh, after a, a, an atrial contraction, you're dropping beats. It looks like another Mobitz type 1. If the PR interval was constant, then you'd call it type 2. Here's another rhythm. You've got PQRS, PPQRS, PPQRS. Um, an interesting rhythm. This is called 2 to 1 AV block. It's a type of second degree AV block. Um, we call it 2 to 1 AV block. Um, but in this case, if you look at V1 and V2, you see an upright uh, QRS, sort of with the bunny ear pattern. This gives you a right bundle branch block. Um, but this patient clearly has conduction disease. And, it, and in, this, in this case, it really depends on if it's the AV node or infrahissian or below the AV node. Um, that would really determine whether or not this patient needs a pacemaker or what exactly this is. And we have ways of testing that. Next rhythm here is also wide. Um, the concern is obviously VTAC. It's a little bit slow. It's a little bit irregular. VTAC is generally regular. If you look at V2, the first two beats are wide and then closer, then wide again. This is AFib with a left bundle branch block again. You see a clear RS complex in V2 and V3, even V4. Uh, V5 looks like maybe it kind of fell off. Um, but there's RS complexes. It's wide. It's much wider than the other one. And it's AFib, so this is another SVT with aberrancy, not beating as fast as that other one. Um, and don't be fooled just because it's irregular. Um, it is irregular, so it is AFib. VTAC is generally pretty regular. Here's another EKG. What do you see here? If you look at V2, uh, that is the correct shape. Uh, concave down, that is your basic uh, anterior acute MI. Even V1 is elevated, so it's a septal. 
anterior QMI, V3, even the ST segment looks abnormal. V4 looks abnormal. Um, but then V6 and 5 look pretty okay. Um, there's no reciprocal changes. Remember, the anterior reciprocates to the inferior. 2, 3, and AVF do not look like they're going down. Um, this could be a residual ST elevation. This could be a patient that's always had ST elevations. It looks a little more than 3. Uh, just by eyeballing, it looks about 4. Um, 4 is not typically normal. Some patients have an acute of mind. Their ST segments never go back to normal does not mean they have an LV aneurysm. A lot of people think that that means you have an LV aneurysm. That's not been proven to be the case. Um, normally in an acute MI, an anterior acute MI, your V4 R wave is under 11 or under 13 millimeters. In this case, it's definitely under uh, 13 millimeters. That's usually diagnostic of an acute anterior MI as long as you have all the other regions. Now this guy is not even complaining of chest pain. It's probably just persistent ST elevations. He comes in saying, ouch, I have chest pain. You're calling the cath lab and starting him in all the proper medications. Next EKG here. You also got ST elevations, V1, V2, V3, even V1 looks a little weird. V4 has a very low R wave and an abnormal ST segment. This is also an ST elevation anterior MI. It almost looks like the hyperacute waves just now connected with the ST segments and got elevated. Um, if you look at lead 3, uh, you definitely have a reciprocal change. It looks depressed, not exactly the right shape, but pretty depressed. So this is probably acute and it's probably happening right now. You have that little R wave in V2, which, which means it's probably been going on a while. That's basically a Q wave. Um, so this is clearly a, a septal anterior uh, MI. Next EKG here shows you what. Looks a little bit on the tachycardic side. So here if you look at this uh, slide, you see slight elevation in V3 and V4. It's a little bit subtle, but you also see a depression in lead uh, three there. So this is more of a subtle uh, anterior uh, elevation of my. Just be careful that you don't miss these. The computer might pick it up or might not, but that's why every EKG should be reviewed by a physician. Two, three, and AVF, definitely the ST segments look down, especially compared to the uh, PR uh, line. Um, and, there, and there is definitely uh, V, v uh, lead elevations um, in the anterior segments. Next EKG looks like ST segment elevations kind of everywhere, and you got that notch in V4 and V5. Don't see it as clearly in lead two. This is your basic early repolarization patient. If you notice how the ST segments don't look like the other ones, and you have a huge tall R wave. When you have an R wave that tall in V4, not an anterior MI, uh, so don't worry about it. Next EKG is what? You have very wide QRS complexes. Um, very broad T waves, they're down and dull and, and diminished. You almost don't even see a P wave in these. This is hyperkalemia, um, not not just mild. If it was mild, you'd have those sharp elevated T waves. This is more than mild. This is getting towards moderate or severe, Yeah, usually in the range of like 6.5 to 7.5, somewhere in there, maybe even more than that. You get broad QRSs, P waves disappear, T waves um, flatten, um, and then you get this, the S wave kind of gets pulled out. If you look at V2, for example, you got a little sharp R uh, or even V5, quick sharp R that, and then goes down to the S and the rest of the S is kind of pulled uh, out and it's slow and wide. Um, so that's exactly hyperkalemia. That's what it does for you. It's an EKG diagnosis. Um, you should never miss this and you got to be getting the patient's uh, potassium down. Believe it when you see it. It's probably not hemolyzed. Get their potassium down with some insulin. Next EKG, if you look at V1, V2, what do you got there? Depressions, V3 depression. So that's immediately, without question, a posterior MI. If you also look at V6, um, you've got a lateral MI as well. If you look at lead 2 and 3, you have an anterior MI. Remember, the shape doesn't matter in 2, 3, and AVF. That's an inferior MI. AVL is reciprocating correctly. AVL is down and depressed, inferior reciprocates to AVL. Remember that if you look at one, it even reciprocates to one, and that even looks abnormal. So this is your basic inferior posterior lateral uh, MI. This person probably has what we call a mega dominant RCA. The RCA feeds the inferior wall. The RV obviously um, 
the uh, posterior wall through the posterior septals, the posterior PDA and PLA, as well as uh, all the way over to the lateral side. It's a mega dominant RCA. Uh, next here, you've got these inverted T waves again um, in uh, AVL and 1. You've got a uh, slight ST elevation in lead 3. Uh, V2, V3 don't look really all that exciting. Um, this is uh, probably an old MI in uh, lead, th lead in the inferior, an old inferior MI. You got these wide Q uh, waves. Remember, they have to be wider than a box, not deeper, but wider, wider than a box, and they are in lead three and AVF um, with this repolarization abnormality in one in AVL. Um, sometimes you want to look for subtle acute MIs. If you look at it, you could probably argue for a subtle inferior MI because you do have an ST elevation in lead 3 as well as AVF plus that very abnormal looking AVL in 1. Remember I told you ST segments never um, localize. You have an ST depression slash abnormality in AVL in 1. Um, even if you look at V6, that lateral lead also looks abnormal. Um, but AVL is definitely abnormal. Whenever you see an ST segment depressed in one area, look for the anterior or look for the reciprocal elevation and you see 3 and AVF are uh, elevated. Very important EKG to be careful with. Don't miss it. Here's your basic anterior MI again. You see uh, V1 through V5 are all elevated. Those reciprocate to your inferior leads. 2, 3 and AVF are not depressed. Uh, probably an acute MI, uh, even without the uh, without the reciprocal changes. Of course, if this guy's had this for a while, then it's not an issue. Um, but if you look at V4, there is no R wave whatsoever in V4. Um, highly goes with an acute MI. If you look at the QT interval, uh, usually 425 for an acute MI is your cutoff. This definitely looks longer than uh, 425, uh, the corrected QT interval. He's a bit tachycardic maybe, so that's why it looks a little off. But definitely... Uh, looks abnormal. Now, if you're not sure, keep getting EKGs, plaster the wall with EKG paper. Um, keep checking it over and over again until you get what you're looking for. Male, 39 years old. What do you got here? If you look at V2, V3, V1, um, you've got that sharp shin, uh, shark fin pattern. Um, this is Brugada. Um, it's a channelopathy. Um, sodium channel has a uh, problem and it causes this pattern. A lot of times these people die, um, suddenly need defibrillators for V-fib and V-tac. Um, we can do tests to provoke this or try to distinguish the type of Brugada it is. This is a type 1 and it's pretty obvious. Sometimes these are confusing because if you look at 2, 3 and AVF, um, sometimes you see ST depressions and that V1 and V2 look elevated um, so it can throw you off. So just be careful if you look at AVF 2 and 3 um, in this case, this this very strange um, shark fin looking pattern, not always this clear to look at, but this is always Brugada. Next one here is obviously someone who's very bradycardic. Um, you have that S wave uh, that's being pulled out. You have almost no P waves. The T's are dull. The QRSs are wide. They're very bradycardic. This is likely somebody with hyperkalemia, um, worse than that other person, um, and. Uh, you just want to be able to diagnose it. If you look at that S, the R is very sharp and then goes down quickly, and then that S kind of drags on and goes slowly. Here's another EKG. You got one in AVL with some depressions. You got ST elevations in three in AVF with Q waves. Probably had an MI quite, uh, probably had an MI that's evolved pretty well. It's already given them Q waves. Um, but basically, don't don't miss this. If you just see AVL depressed like that, look for the uh, elevations in, in the area that reciprocates to it. All the rest of his leads seem okay. This guy's having an RCA infarct. Um, if you look at lead 2, or I'm sorry, if you look at lead 3, it's definitely more elevated than lead 2. So this gives us a uh, R, RV infarct uh, as well, so keep that in mind. The previous EKG that I showed you also... Um, with the RV infarct, lead 3 was definitely more elevated than lead 2, so that also gives you an RV infarct in that last inferior MI, the one with the mega dominant RCA. Here's another EKG. Um, you've got ST elevations in 3, AVF, and you have that ST depression slash abnormal looking ST segment in AVL. This is also a um, acute MI. 
inferior MI, lead 3 elevation higher than lead 2. This is a RV infarct. Um, notice the R wave in V4 is very tall, so there's no anterior issues going on there. Um, this is your basic inferior MI with AVL there being the reciprocal area with lead 3 higher than lead 2. So this means it's a RV infarct. Lots of fluids. Don't give them anything that would drop their blood pressure. No morphine, no nitro, no beta blockers. Um, they are bradycardic already. If you count up these QRSs, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So they're in, their, they're in the 50s somewhere. Um, but this is uh, some you got to keep a close eye on and get them to the cath lab. Here's the next one. What do you see here? Deep inverted T waves, and these are the ones we're talking about again. COPD gives you this, and a, a, a PE can give you this. Brain hemorrhage or intracranial hemorrhage can do this. If a patient comes in confused with this kind of a pattern on an EKG, CT their head before you get excited about anything else. Next EKG here shows lead one upright, two and three are down. That gives you a left anterior fascicular block. You're looking at uh, your rate, rhythm, and access. Everything else looks pretty okay. Next one here, got that wide QRS again. Almost no P waves, dull, blunted T waves. Got that S segment that's being stretched. You've got your basic hyperkalemia patient again. It's an EKG diagnosis. Do not miss this. Here's another one. A little bit on the bradycardic side, you do see P waves. Every QRS has a P wave. Um, very low voltage in the limb leads, uh, two especially. Um, you got lead one down, lead two upright. You could argue that this is right access deviation. You got AVF to double check, so it is right access deviation. Next one, very bradycardic, very low amplitude. Once again, you got to be thinking um, effusions. Uh, pneumothorax, um, anything that puts water or air between the heart and the anterior chest wall. Next one here, you've got sinus rhythm. Looks okay. AVF looks a little unusual, and so does lead 3. The ST segments in 2, 3, and AVF look a little bit uh, unusual. And AVL, now that I look at it again, the ST segment looks a little unusual. This is probably a uh, very subtle inferior MI, um, but just keep an eye on the patient, repeat EKGs. If it becomes obvious, then it's obvious. It may reveal itself. Next EKG here um, shows um, mainly a sinus rhythm, a few PACs. A couple beats are coming a little early. Actually, if you look at the P waves closely, and that's why it's irregular, I thought they were PACs, but if you look at the P waves closely, they're actually all different. Um, look at that bottom strip, lead two at the bottom. You got a P wave that's like double notch, then a blunted P wave, then a sharp one, then an even taller one, then an upside down one, then another one, then a really sharp and pointy one kind of in the middle there. So this is your basic MAT, multifocal atrial tachycardia. Fix the lungs, you'll fix the problem. Next, we have two EKGs in a row. If you look at this one, lead two, you got upright P waves. If you look at the next one, the P waves are kind of downright and coming from a different area. This patient is the same exact patient. Uh, again, EKG number one, EKG number two. This patient has what we call an ectopic atrial rhythm. Because that second EKG, the P wave is uh, um, fairly upside down, um, we know that it's uh, coming lower in the right atrium. Next uh, EKG, you got two patients in a row. Um, here's you got your P waves and a wide QRS um, with a left bundle branch block. If you look at V2 and 3, um, V6 there uh, looks like it has some artifacts, so don't confuse that. And then you look a couple beats later, and the patient appears to be going faster. Um, so the question in these cases is always, you know, what is this? Um, is it um, a sinus rhythm or an atrial tachycardia? Is it a ventricular tachycardia? Well, it, just looking at it carefully, um, you do kind of see that uh, sawtooth pattern. Um, and it may be that the patient went into um, an atrial flutter, um, given that they have that left bundle branch block. That's why it looks that way. Uh, but it also could be just that their rate picked up. They, are, they look like they're in a faster AFib. Uh, 
uh, maybe the beats are a little bit irregular. Um, the only way to know really is to slow them down and, and try to look at their rhythm, but it looks a little bit on the irregular side. The fact that there's RS um, waves or RS patterns in all the anterior chest leads means that it's actually um, not VTAC. Next EKG here, um, you're looking at ST elevations pretty much everywhere. If you look at V4, V5, V2, um, could be early repo, but it's not really the right shape. Um, if you look at lead two, um, you see that the PR segment is, is somewhat um, depressed. When you have a PR segment like that, uh, that's depressed below the isoelectric line, the isoelectric line being the end of that T wave and the beginning of the P wave. When you have it depressed like that, it, it leads you to think they have stage one or two pericarditis. And pericarditis has multiple different stages on an EKG. It's really the first phase um, uh, that causes those ST elevations and PR depression. So keep an eye on those. Next EKG here, uh, you're looking at a fairly slower rhythm. P before every QRS. Um, if you look at uh, the one beat towards the end of that rhythm strip, at, or like V4 and V5, that second beat there, it's just a PVC. I think that's all we're trying to show with this one. I don't, I don't really see anything else. Next one, uh, if you look at it, the question is, what is this rhythm? Is it VTAC uh, or not? Um, that's kind of the question we're always asking. It's fast. It's got some wide beats. Looks like there's a PVC that looks different than all the rest of them. Um, you definitely see R, RS complexes, um, so that definitely uh, doesn't give it away. I mean, that definitely gives it away that it's not VTAC, which is the most important thing in this case. We want to know that it's not VTAC. If you look at V1 and V2, you got that bunny ear up there in V1, and it's upright, so that makes it a right bundle branch block. If you look at 1, 2, and 3, you got up, down, down. That gives you left anterior fascicular block. This guy has a lot of conduction disease and a, and a lot of ectopy. Um, could eventually ultimately need a pacemaker. When you have a right bundle branch block and a left anterior fascicular block, um, we call that we call that bifascicular block. Um, the next one here, if you look at it closely, you also got um, that. Uh, if you look at V1, really, if you focus on V1, um, you've got that um, right bundle branch block, um, probably an old posterior MI. Um, tall R waves there it could also mean um, RVH. Um, that's always a possibility. Um, there seems to be some kind of conduction abnormality or repolarization abnormality with the ST segments going down and the T waves being down. Um, but that's probably all that is. Every QRS has a P in front of it, uh, except for that PVC right around where V4 and V5 start. But otherwise, it looks pretty normal. Uh, the next one here, if you look at the lead one and lead two, you got some baseline um, artifact. Uh, makes it a little bit uh, confusing, but there's definitely a little bit of artifact there. Um, and you got these, um, if you look at lead three, there's that repolarization abnormality again. Um, this probably LVH uh, is what's causing this. Sometimes it's more pronounced. If you look at, um, there's a big S wave in lead one. There's a uh, Q in lead three and a T inversion in lead three. Uh, they call that S1 uh, Q3 T3 or a right-sided strain pattern. Um, sometimes that indicates um, like elevated right-sided pressures, things that can cause that are like a PE. If you look at lead V2, you have a tall R wave there, which also leads you to believe that something happened to the RV where it's hypertrophied or there's a lot of uh, strain on it or a right-sided strain pattern. Now, if you ask me what are the five most common EKG findings in somebody with a pulmonary embolism, the answers are number one, sinus tack. Number two, can anybody guess it? Number two is also sinus tack. Number three is sinus tack. Number four is sinus tack. Number five is sinus tack. You rarely ever get this right-sided uh, strain pattern or the S1, Q3, T3, um, but here's kind of an example of what it would look like. Next EKG you got these very wide QRSs, almost no P waves. The Q segments are down and blunted. This is almost going into the sine wave pattern of hyperkalemia. Once again, the S is kind of way stretched out. If you look at V6, if you can imagine an or V5 or V4, actually, if you look at that, there's an R there, and then the S gets stretched way out. 
Uh, the next one here is very, very tachycardic. You see almost no P waves or they're kind of coming after the QRSs. Um, this is your basic AVNRT. Um, if, junctional tachycardia never goes this fast. Um, AFib would be irregular. Um, now AFib sometimes when it's really, really fast looks very regular. Um, but if you slow it down, you can tell what it is. This guy uh, needs some adenosine or some vagal maneuvers and will convert. If you give them adenosine and they slow down and they look like they're in AFib, then it's AFib. And obviously they need calcium channel blockers like diltiazem uh, or esmolol or some kind of a drip to slow them down. But diltiazem seems to be uh, the best. Next here, you've got a uh, pattern. Somebody had some pretty sinus beats, then had a couple of early PVCs or early uh, PAC fusion beats, and then decompensated into this rhythm, um, which is called polymorphic VTAC. All that means is different shaped VTAC, um, where we call it torsades de point, um, which is this uh, twisting around a point. This is uh, torsades. How do you get them out of this? You can either you have to defibrillate them. You got to give them amiodarone. Um, to stabilize ventricular uh, arrhythmias, amiodarone and magnesium in this case would help. Um, the key is figuring out what happened with this. If you notice this patient actually, if you look at the very first beat, it looks like they have a very prolonged QT interval. Um, and then the P wave kind of hit on it, the P wave, and then obviously the QRS. Um, the QRS actually looks like it's coming in the middle of the, uh, the T wave. The T wave doesn't even reach like, look like it's reached baseline. And then you have that PVC or whatever that is that hit the next T wave, and that's probably what caused this. Next, you see um, fairly low voltage EKG with a right bundle branch block there. Um, you see the uh, S1, Q3, T3 pattern again, it looks like. Um, very subtle, but it's definitely there. Um, you have a C at S in 1, which you rarely see. You see a S in 3 and an inverted T there. It's probably all this is trying to show. You definitely have a right bundle branch block and a tall R in V1, which gives you the right-sided uh, strain pattern. Uh, the next one here shows you elevated uh, ST segments kind of everywhere, V5, V4. V4 almost looks like it has that early repo notch there. Um, if you look at the PR interval... In lead 2 and lead 1, it definitely looks depressed, leaning more towards pericarditis in this one than anything else. The next one here, I obviously have a right bundle branch block. Um, and that's about it, really. I don't see much else uh, exciting on that one. Mainly a uh, right bundle branch block. Um, doesn't really look like anything. It definitely doesn't look like an anterior STEMI. If you look at V2 and V1, um, those segments, they, although they appear a little bit suspicious, if you look at lead 2 and 3, it looks more like the LVH. So whenever you have ST elevations, you want to make sure it's not LVH. And because of the way those ST segments look, this is um, uh, LVH uh, repolarization abnormality, which is giving you that very strange uh, ST segment pattern. Uh, the next one here is a little bit on the tachycardic side. There's definitely P waves. Um, lead 3 looks a little bit funny um, probably a very subtle um, inferior MI there uh, more than anything um, AVL uh, which is the usual place it reciprocates to the ST segment does look a little strange um, so I would probably go for a very subtle ST MI in the inferior leads if you look at AVF it also looks uh, elevated uh, next here is this VTAC is kind of what the question is going to be. Um, you have V2 very wide, V3 wide, all the rest of them are pretty wide. Do you have an RS complex in any of the precordial leads? And it looks like you kind of do. In V4 you have more of a, a um, SR really. In this one, I, I would uh, lean more towards VTAC. I don't see a clear RS. There's no initial positive deflection. It all looks um, like it goes down then up, if anything. Um, in this case, I would say this is probably VTAC. You could use Brugada's criteria for VTAC and look at the actual shapes and decide if this is really uh, VTAC or not. Uh, the next one here, you've got... Um, Pretty much sinus rhythm. You got a left bundle branch block with some widening. Uh, 
uh, of the QRS complexes. Um, if you look carefully at the PR interval, the PR interval, PR interval looks a little shortened. The, the, the QRS starts almost immediately after every P. It's very noticeable in V6 and V5. Uh, so this is your WPW or your delta, your delta wave. Um, very noticeable in lead one as well. It's the QRS starts way early. This is because of an early activation through an accessory pathway. If these people ever come in with AFib, you do not give them AV nodal blocking agents because they can decompensate and go into VTAC or VFib. You want to slow them down and, and block the accessory pathway with something like uh, procainamide. Next slide here. This is definitely VTAC. There's absolutely no RS complexes, very wide, very regular. If you did find the P waves, they'd be uh, AV dissociation. Don't really see that because it's hard. Um, but this is uh, clearly VTAC. Next one here looks like another AVNRT. You see ST depressions and ischemia throughout. Remember, ischemia does not localize. You see 2 and V5 are the most sensitive. So you definitely see ischemia there. And that would be what I would lean towards. Next one is a very slow rhythm, very bradycardic ST elevations in 2 and 3 in AVF with AVL reciprocating. You got posterior MIA V1, V2, V3. Um, this is your basic inferior posterior MI. Um, V6 is elevated too, so you could say it's lateral as well. Um, so inferior posterior lateral MI. Lead 3 is definitely a little bit elevated compared to lead 2. When you can't tell by the ST segments, you look at the T segments. If the T is higher in lead 3, then it is an RV infarct, and it looks like it is, so we'll probably go with that as well. Next one here, you've got 2, 3, and AVF look elevated. AVL is depressed, which is a reciprocal change. This is probably an RV infarct because 3 is higher than 2 as well. Um, so this is also your basic uh, inferior uh, MI, no posterior involvement if you look there. So it's probably proximal enough to hit the RV, but uh, distal um, collaterals are supplying the posterior branches. Next one is your why on earth are you doing this EKG and not doing chest compressions EKG? This guy is absolutely bradycardic, sine wave pattern. This is when you're hyperkalemic and your potassium is like 9 or 10. Um, this is a horrible EKG to have. This person needs insulin right away and dialysis. Um, you should be putting in a quintin and shooting him with insulin and, and potassium and calcium gluconate. And once again, I ask, why are you doing this EKG? But thank you, because I was able to uh, pick this up and save it. Next one uh, shows ST elevations in your anterior leads, depressions in your inferior leads. Remember, the anterior always reciprocates to inferior, and this is a correct reciprocation. V4, the R wave is very low, definitely an anterior MI. If you measured the QT corrected interval, 425 is your cutoff, definitely an anterior MI. The shape is right. The reciprocation is correct. You also have AVL elevated, so it's an anterior lateral MI. Um, this could be a left main um, inf uh, occlusion. If your left main is occluded, that occludes your CERC and your LAD. Um, and that is probably what's going on here. The fact that uh, V1 is a little elevated, AVR might be a little elevated, kind of all leads you to believe that it's a left main occlusion or just some very proximal occlusion. Next uh, EKG, you've got PQRS, 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 a little bit um, unusual. You look at all the P waves and PR complexes, they're bradycardic. Every time it's bradycardic, you got to look for a third degree AV block. All the PR intervals are different. None of them are exactly the same. This is your basic uh, case of uh, third degree AV block. And I think that is all we have. All right, great. Um, these are all the different ways you can reach me. Those are my two kids, Zane and Razan. Zane means good. Razan means intelligent. So hopefully we will all be very good and intelligent about EKGs and uh, reading EKGs. Hopefully this has helped you. If it has, subscribe to my YouTube channel, spread the word about this, and tell everyone uh, about uh, Dr. Allo. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you later.